this is sort of odd for me out of all these years I've taught and done classes, done a lot of talking. Uh, I've done the beginners classes this year and we've had to do the same thing. But the good part about this is if you stay in the Master Gardeners and use what you're taught here, uh, you'll learn a lot more. Uh, it's taken me years, like Tom says, 26 years for me. And to me, every year is a little bit different, but it's like I'm one of the believers that if you don't use it, you lose it. And what I did is I wanted to teach when I got in. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew gardening. I have 12 generations from here. I grew up on a farm here. So when people ask me questions, I always get, I'm very surprised at what I did learn over the years as a master gardener. And I've been very lucky to have three agents like Tom. Joe Nichols was one. And then I had Kelly. He was there and then Tom came in and it's been just to me, it's been just great the whole time because it's one of the things you can really give back to the community. But what they have me do, so y'all get to hear Stephanie this next week in her uh, landscape design class. Y'all are gonna absolutely love that class. I tell her, I said, she always makes me do the lawn grass class because it's one of the things, nobody else would do it. And, and I thought when I first started, now you gotta understand, I've been in a long time. So when I first started, they said, you wanna teach how to grow grass? Well, y'all know what kind of grass I thought they would want to teach. So, but in choosing this, what I did, I took 300 and something slides that I was taught. Um, and Tom Samples, I was very, very lucky. He is the guru of grass for Tennessee. He grew all the grass in Neyland Stadium. So I took his three or 400 slides and I've sort of honed it down over the years. Now I say slides literally, cause that's what I first started doing. Now, uh, now I'm lucky enough to do a PowerPoint. Some people don't like it, some people do. And ladies, if you go to sleep a little bit, that's okay, get some deep. But what, what I try to do is give you questions that you're gonna be asked as master gardeners over a period of time and let you learn through osmosis. So this first half is about choosing the line grass. And if any time that you wanna ask a question, please chime in. Because one of the things I like to do is give a little quiz or talk as we go along. And so when we're going through here, people look at this. Most of you know what this is, correct? So yeah, this is actually a grass because it has the same gene as a grass, it's bamboo. And it all has its points because every grass or weed has its own place to be in your garden. So when you look at this, these are some of the shots from Stephen Meyer, when we, our house that we had, we moved into this little thousand square feet. We actually had a lawn that was in a garden. We had 14 different gardens and a quarter acre and it was on the garden tour twice. So a lot of the shots that I do, we used it as a teaching. Um, so as you can see here, the grass in here is used as a highlight. It's not the focal point. So what you're doing, you're going around through it. It's got to lead you someplace when you're doing it. So I use the grass here as a path. Now this is a different type of grass and it also has a purpose. Everything that you do, you want to do in your garden has a purpose, sort of not as haphazardly. Stephanie said all the time she'll tell you that I have her get, she gets plants and stuff and the first thing I'll ask her is where you're going to put it. In this case, uh, of course we had plants that she put in her driveway and they sit there for six months and I still ask her where she's going to put it. But in this case, this is sea oats. Sea oats helps with erosion. As you can see, it's more or less a beach area. So this, and this is one I always show, I always still think is still funny. I got this out of the first class I had. And the only th way to do this, if you want to get there most, put a goat on your roof. So you, it actually has its own purpose. It'll serve as, uh, people will put it up there and it's, uh, I guess you would call it a green roof. But if you look at what it is, and, this right here, can, uh, and keep in the back of your mind, how many types of grass are there really? Anybody know? Yes, no? I'd love to have you in front of me. Oh, oh, yep, there you go. She's already spotted it. There's two types. There's warm season, there's cool season. And what's the real problem where we live? You're right dead in the transition zone. We're not far enough north where it stays cool year round. 
You're not far enough south, so it stays hot year round. So you sort of have to pick between the two of which one you really want. And when I say warm season, cool season, we'll talk a little bit about the different varieties that are in there. There's only two types, but there may be as many as eight, 10 varieties in there. And so as we talk through this, you sort of want, you're gonna get asked a question. They're gonna come up and ask you, what kind of grass do I have? One of the first things to do is ask them, does it turn brown during the winter? If it turns brown when it gets cold, it is gonna be a warm season grass. If it doesn't, it's cool season. Cool season will only turn a little slightly brown as you move along during the summer when it gets really, really hot. And that's one reason I became a warm season fanatic because I never had to worry about mowing my grass during the winter. So you see this, you're gonna see this a lot here. People will look at this and say, oh, there's something really wrong with my grass. No, it's not really. And what you find in this, and you, and you look around when they give you this right here, it's frost. When the frost first hits a warm season grass, you're gonna get a freeze pattern in your yard. What that does, that makes that grass go dormant a little bit sooner. And so you're gonna see that in the different areas. And you can see the different, uh, how, much, how cold it gets during the winter up through the chart over to the left. So as you'll look right here, you'll see this yard's gone dormant except for two locations. One's along the sidewalk and one's underneath the tree. Okay. And the reason for that is you got microclimates. The microclimate is under the tree. It helps hold the heat underneath. The sidewalk's keeping it warm along the outside edge. So that grass will stay greener there longer. Also, bad thing about the sidewalk, it'll get hot real hot on cool season grass. A lot of times that's the only place you'll see crabgrass show up. Now here's the response for warm season grass. And when you do this, this is what happens as you as temperature decreases. You'll see the shoot growth go down uh, over the top when it's 60 to 80 degrees. When it says warm season grass, it loves it hot. And also when it, as you get a little bit colder, the plant will harden itself off. That means it's trying to protect itself. And at 50 to 55 degrees, you'll get you'll see the leaves start curling or start getting a little brown. And then 32 to 50, it goes totally brown. Now, this grass on warm season grasses here, a lot of them will, if you get 20 to 32, you're going to get a little shoot uh, die off. And if it goes below 20 where the ground will freeze, you may get a little spotty uh, plant kill isolated plant killer in your lawn. So when you're doing when you're doing the grasses, you got to put pick seed sod, cool season, warm season. And so a cool season grass, you're going to have in this area, you'll have fescue, blue grasses, rye, and also what I call look for blends. When somebody asks you what type of cool season grass you're going to have, most people reach and grab Kentucky 31 or a uh, fescue. I ask everybody, look for blends. Blends have four or more varieties of grass seed, which with the microclimates that they're going to have in their yard, the grasses will do better. So if you have, if you pick a blend and it has those different varieties, you'll be better off. A lot of people take Kentucky 31 because it's cheap. And I tell them you get for what you pay. So if you get blends, you're going to have better success so if you have that in your yard, you're gonna get that smoother texture with cool season. Warm season grasses, there's really, there's more than the two choices. There's zoysia bermuda, and you also have, uh, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Uh, you got two other types of grass, and I'll show them in a minute. But anyway, zoysia bermuda are the two types you see the most. So cool season turf grasses, you have annual rye grasses, chewing fescues, hard fescues, tall fescues, then if you get a blend, it's going to have a combination, it can have a combination of all those varieties. So if you look at what's in there, you'll see uh, some of them will have uh, annual ryegrass. Try to not get a blend and recommend they not get a blend of one that has uh, a uh, perennial ryegrass. Perennial ryegrasses have a tendency to clump up during the uh, summer and they're harder to get rid of. Annual ryegrass is going to die off during when it gets really hot. 
And this is the reason people in this area like to use long grasses. They can grow, use seed. You can plant seed this time of year, but they're gonna have a problem because as it gets hot, you're gonna see it right here of what happens to it. And they would have to water all during the summer in order for that little grass seed to maintain a plant. The best time to actually do this would be in starting in late August, September, October, and even into November the way it's been lately. But as you can see, the perfect shoot growth is the temperature at the soil will be 60 to 75 degrees. We're almost perfect right now. That temperature is not warm enough for tomatoes, but it's really good for growing that grass seed because 60 to 75 is a good time for that to grow. Upper limit, now you can see why this does bad in the summer, 90 degrees. Once it gets to 90, this grass definitely wants to go dormant. People said, oh, my grass will still grow. Yeah, because the rain we rainfall we get acts as an air conditioner for that little seedling. It will still grow. That's the reason you end up having to cut it during the summer. But the lower limit is 40 degrees. I've actually done this, and this is stupid. <laughs> I took and I wanted to see if I could take and grow grass. And I, I sowed, uh, sowed my yard, and I, like I said, I, I grew zoysia grass. I took a seed slitter and I went and I planted annual ryegrass to see if I'd have a green cover crop so I'd have it during the winter. Yep, I did. I was mowing my grass in January with my, uh, a little gloves and a hat on. So that was really dumb on my part because I ended up having to be out there taking care of the grass in the winter. Now here is cool season lawn grass. This is the root growth. So you look at the soil's temperature, you know, optimum is 50 to 65, upper limit 77. Well, once that ground gets to 77 degrees, the roots, uh, the roots will go dormant. The lower limit, literally your ground has to be totally froze for that little cool season grass not to grow. So 33 degrees, it'll continue to grow if you fertilize it during the cool season. Now this right here is why is what I give to people for tall fescue because this is what most people, they'll go and buy a great big bag of this, a 50 pound bag is cheap. And if you let this grass grow, and most of you, if you look right here around this, you really don't want to cut this grass any lower than any three to four inches during the summer. And I'd always tell everybody, set your mower as high as it will go because it will continue to grow during the summer. But you want that grass to be nice, thick. You don't want the weed seeds to get there. You want to hold the water in. And you definitely do not want to fertilize this thing after April 15th. April 15th is the last cutoff. Remember tax day. There's two reasons why, and I'll tell you the second one when I get to the warm season. This is when realistically you're going to go to winter for a cool season grass. And people say, well, I'll fertilize all during the summer. Well, I'll tell you in a minute why that's a waste of money. And the other reason is, is because this little, little seedling right here, if you going to put fertilizer out April 15th, look at using a winterizer because the winter for that, for this, for cool season grass is the summer. So when they say a winterizer, you want to put a winterizer and that's what you recommend to them. Use the winterizer during the summer. And it only thing you should be doing in the summer is taking and getting rid of weeds and just controlling it, you know, cause that grass is basically dormant once you get into June, July, August, and part of September. So, Seed production, if you look at this, that's, if you look at tall fescue, if you let it go, it will get three feet. And the reason that people started with lawns, putting lawns in their yard, somebody came out and said, hey, I think we can sell this people. I got this thing called a lawn mower. If we do it, we can sell it to all the people in the city and we'll make a bunch of money. And that's what they did, because this was originally uh, used for uh, out in the fields for cattle. And it has, some of them have large seed production. If you look at the Kentucky bluegrass, bluegrass will put tons of seed out. Now, you don't see it as much here because in the last 10 years, it has, it has not been as cool as the past. And so you just don't see as much unless you're on the mountains or you're out towards uh, the Smokies over on the other side. Uh, let's see. All right, there's the Kentucky bluegrass. Now this one, It'll run, has runners just like we do, rhizomes and runners that go under the ground. If you can get it established, it actually does pretty well uh, because it will feed off the other plants. That's the reason warm season grass is true sod type grass. 
because it puts out rhizomes and uh, stolons that run under the ground and it will create new plants. Whereas uh, uh, fescues, ryegrasses, those type grasses, they're called clump type grasses and they form straight down. And it's a true fact that if you can get eight inches of topsoil and you let your top mirror it, it will get eight inches of root depth too. It will continue to grow straight down. Now, these are some of the blends. If you look on the, on the labels on these type, they will have anywhere from four to eight. Rebel Supreme is really good. Generally, I, like, I also like uh, uh, the Barnes uh, Tennessee Turf Mix they have. It's really good. And so when you get these, you can take, and you look on the back, this is what you're gonna see. This one happens to have uh, a 47% tall fescue, Gulf annual ryegrass. It has a red fescue, which is really good because a lot of times that'll have runners on it. Then it also has a little bit bluegrass. Of course, most of them, if you look down at the bottom, it's got a little bit of weed seed in it too. So, and here's another, another label that's really good. If you look at it, it'll give you the percentage of what they have in the range and they'll look at the chewing fescues and it'll give you sort of what they may have inside the bag. Now this is what most people would like to see. And the reason is if you, you have to set the management program up for this, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the second half of this. But the lawns nowadays, a lot of people like to use, have nice lawns, maybe a smaller amount. And I'll give you, with ours, we started, when we first did our house, we did it over a period of seven, eight years. And if we were been together, uh, people, some people have seen it. I do a uh, sort of a little slideshow, let, uh, let it run at the start, and it shows our yard from uh, 2007 through 2014. It took us seven years to get that lawn and the, all the gardens the way we wanted it. And so we picked it out over a period of time. When we first moved in, it took me an hour and 45 minutes to cut our yard. Over the period of time I took the gardens there, it took me 45 minutes uh, once I got all the gardens in place. Now that's, I'm gonna tell you, a lawn, it does take a little bit more time. The reason being because there's more fertilization to it, uh, the dethatching, but people would come to our yard when they come in there, literally the grass was cut and you could take your shoes off, walk through it and it'd give you a foot massage you go through there. So a lawn, to me, it has a purpose. I think it gives formality in it. You can use it wherever you want to. And I think as long as you've got anywhere from four to six hours of sunlight, you can have a nice lawn and it can look really good. This one here has been probably, uh, it's probably been dethatched. It's probably been aerated several times. It's probably fertilized probably. And you don't really see a weed, weed in that one. So if you take a look at it, you know, you've got to get, you want that closed canopy. That's what you're after with the grass, any type of grass that you have. And that's the other reason that I liked um, warm season grasses. They create a turf which closes that canopy a little tighter, doesn't allow the weeds to get in there very much. But when you establish it, it goes along, it goes uh, and get it established in there. The weeds are easier to get out. Now here's several others that are in there that are done in that category. You can see they probably use different varieties but they've used it in different spaces. So you see the house to the left, it's a whole lot of lawn, a lot of formality. The one that's over to the right is a little bit less. It's probably, they probably use this grass for a highlight because you see a little bit more of the garden in there and they, they, they it needs to lead you someplace. And here are warm season turf grasses. Now, like I told you, there were a couple more and I knew I'd forget them. You got Bermuda, centipede for people that do not want uh, to fertilize or use chemicals or something like that. Centipede is the way to go. It is actually called graveyard grass. And the reason being, that's where it was discovered. If you throw nitrogen to centipede, it will actually kill it. So it lacks our poor soils. It's, it is a warm season grass. It does put runners out. And it's, it, it, but it, it's a re really good grass for people that don't like to fertilize. Now, St. Augustine, I've seen two in Chattanooga. I've seen one gentleman that actually sowed it from seed. If you've ever seen any of these grass seeds, if you look at them, put them in the palm of your hand, it looks like dust. Generally, you put, if you have a pound of seed, of this type of seed, you can put a pound of this with about 10 pounds of sand and scatter it, 
and that does pretty well because a, a pound of that will go a long way. So warm season long grass is for your, like I said, Bermuda grass, soja grass, centipede, and St. Augustine. Now, warm season grass is the shoot growth. Here's why during the summer, spring, and the fall, early fall, it's really good. Soil temperature, optimum 80 to 95 degrees. So when it gets really hot outside, you're, that grass is just eating it up. Look at the upper limit for the soil surface temperature for shoot growth, 120 degrees. So at my, my yard in the front, I had a sidewalk. I had a 12 inch space that was between there and a curb. Well, every, I, I wanted to see what it'd do. I put the grass out there, planted it. Now I did have irrigation because it does get dry. Everybody in my neighborhood, there was 33 houses, everybody in the neighborhood between sidewalk and the edge, edge of the uh, curb, they, they would just get bare, dry soil during the summer. Mine stayed green. People always ask me, how did I get keep my grass green? Well, number one is I had irrigation. But the second thing is, this grass is made for that type of temperature. Look at the lower limit, though. Once that ground temperature goes to 65 degrees, it's still brand new. A lot of the, a lot of most, most warm season grasses right now are, you might see a little bit of shoot growth at the bottom, but most of them will not green up till about the middle to the end of this month, and they'll hit, they hit full during the uh, start in May. Look at the root growth on this thing. So on warm season grass, it's often 75 to 85 degrees. So about the same temperatures as what tomatoes like. It. If you want the tomato, once that ground grows up, it warms up, this grass is gonna be starting to get good root growth, upper limit 110 degrees. So if even 80, 90 degree days during the, when you think it's out there next to the curb, this stuff's still growing. Yeah, the lower limit is 50 though. That soil surface gets down to 50, the root growth basically stops. Now this is why warm season grass does really well. Because you have a stolen, a leaf bud and a rhizome. So if you look at that, the rhizome grows underground, sort of like it, those of you that grow uh, irisid, it'll have, it's, that's similar to the way it does. And the leaf bud, you can see at the top, and the stolen is a, that will actually grow across the ground. And if you, if you have Combra Bermuda, every place that's the reason it does so well, anytime you cut this and you've got a little plant there, now you've created another individual plant that's gonna put off more growth. So that's the reason people hate common Bermuda because it, it goes out there and you have all kinds of issues. And here is the scourge of your garden. By the way, each one of those little pods on seed pods on top probably have it between 30 and 70,000 seeds on top of it. If you let it get to that, that point there, you're gonna have some real issues. But UT has a machine that's really pretty cool for people that like golf and like football. They have a thing called a verticutter. And what it does, it goes in and where each one of these plants are together, it not only cuts the grass this way, it will cut into each one of these little pieces, creating a new one, so it thickens that canopy around the outside. And it's really, really good for warm season grasses because it makes it much, much thicker. And that's what you're really after. You're after that thick canopy that goes out. So, now see, tipway Bermuda, a lot of people say, oh, my Bermuda grass is to put seed, but this one was made where it didn't have any seed. So you can buy varieties that do not produce seed. All it is, you don't have to worry about it spreading so much. Now, Bermuda grass, reason I like Zoysia or Bermuda, Zoysia stolons and rhizomes grow slower. Bermuda grass, you can take that sometimes, special calm Bermuda, I've seen it take off and run, it'll go all the way across the dry, 12 foot driveway under the ground and come up on the other side. So it's one of those things you have, and there's ways to get rid of it, but it's a little hard. But if you look at this, here's one reason that I do it. You look at the house that gives all these warm season grasses, give a little more formality because it's a smoother surface. If you see, you go around and look at different yards that have Bermuda, Zoysia, centipedes a little bit more, has a little more uh, pockets of, uh, that weeds could grow in. But what I like about it, look at the one to the right. See that one's sort of partial shade that you have. It's shady probably during the day. Bermuda, all the warm season grasses are true sod type grasses. They're not clumped. So what it's gonna do, it will feed back from the other rhizomes that are back behind it. So if you have an area that's a little bit shady or you get a little bit, you know, two or three hours of shade day 
and you've got a good lawn like this and it's thick, as long as it gets four to six hours of sun, it'll keep that nice green color and keep that, that smooth look to it. So those are the things that you have to look out for as you're going through it. Now the house down in the far corner, I like what they've done there. They've brought the grass up to it. It's a little more formal, but they've used, used the edging on the outside of it to sort of stop where it goes. Some Bermuda grasses will have a huge amount. Mirage is one of them. It, it will put seed everywhere. And to be honest with you, some golf courses like this because as they golfers go out there and have a tendency to be hackers, they'll cut up it, cut, it, cut the grass up, and right where they cut it up, the seed will drop back into it and in order to have a new seedling to fill the spot. This is always a grass. Now people say, oh, it doesn't look much different from Bermuda, but there are several varieties. There is one that you can write down, it's called Jamira, J-A-M-U-R. And I bought it from, uh, from North Georgia turf grass. We did a little experiment probably 10 years ago at the county fair, and I planted the entire path through our uh, expo with different types of grass. Jamira was the only grass out of all the grasses I put in there that actually survived about 10,000 people walking on it with the rain. And there's still some up there, I found, I found it in spots, but what it does, it has a blade that looks similar to fescue. It's a thicker blade. Uh, Xeon, uh, the uh, Emerald, and Myers all have thin blades, so it'll, it'll be a little thinner, it'll look a little more formal. But uh, if you get if you get Jamir, it will it will be one of those that that you can put in your yard, and it looks a lot like uh, fescue. Now, here are the different ones I just mentioned. And if you look at, you got the uh, you see the thicker blades, the the zinnia up in the top, they grow that a lot in Atlanta. Uh, the emerald and the Myers is what you see more here. The Zeon in the bottom is what I had, and the reason I like that one is because it had the thin blade, plus it took a little bit of shade a little bit better. Jamir is the other one that's right there and you can see how, much, how thick the blade is on that one. So it's a real, if somebody asks you, uh, can I get a warm season that looks similar to my fescue? Yes, you can. Can you grow the two together? Not very good because they'll overlap and have different fertilization times. Now this was my front yard. And what we did, we originally sowed it and I, I'm, we wanted a little bit more formality to it. And so we, we did this, I think we put it in in 2007. And it, it, it took a couple of years and I think I've got a couple of shots later showing the establishment of it. But this was the backyard and I planted the backyard like this and we had, Stephanie had uh, one of the daylilies and tree roses and we had irises back there, but she wanted that, she loved to play bocce ball and she'll tell you that. So I made her an area that was big enough where we could entertain and have people around. Of course, she has seating in her place there too. She'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Now this is looking the other direction. And as you can see, the reason I like this shot, if you look, the little path that goes in between it leads you across uh, the stream that we had and the waterfall that's back there. But that little area in between was the only area they got four to six hours of sun. And what I did, I, I, I wanted a different path to go through there. I didn't want to just put anything down. And it actually worked really, it was perfect. Uh, Cause I got a little more shade over on the right hand side. We had a camellia, we had two camellias there. We had a gardenia there and a couple of tree peonies. And then well, on the other side, we had peonies there plus a 14 foot tall limelights on the other side. And then Stephanie also had her, if you look in the middle, that's her, I want to call it her bird, uh, food court, had eight different types of places for birds. But that's what I'm looking at. You're looking at where you can use this. And here's the hardy temperature. If you look at zoysia, it takes the cold uh, a little bit better than Bermuda grasses, St. Augustine and centipedes here. That's the other reason that I chose it because it doesn't have as much winter kill. So if you get below 20 degrees, the ground stays there for a little while you could get some die off in certain areas. And I just found that Zoysia didn't have that as much. This is the reason people don't like it. If you look down, the guy next to, the gentleman next to us had a fescue lawn. Well, the guy on the far end actually had a Bermuda lawn that he let fescue get into. But the other reason that I, I don't mind this because you can aerate it, dethatch it, 
And if you look down and right down here in the corner, got a little spot there and got one right there. See those two green patches? I know those are weeds because they're growing. So I could go out there on my fingers and I could just pull it up. That's the good side. The downside, people says, I don't like a brown lawn. Well, I didn't like mowing my grass during the winter. And I said, okay, you have pluses and minuses for both. So here's the relative growth. And if you look at this, here is this is going to give you the fertilization times for fescue. Fescues and bluegrasses, anything cool season wise, will have five fertilization times. Right here, you got, you look, look at this right here, you got on, on for this, you got March, April, May, June. You look at that on, on, the, on the relative growth right there. So if you look at it, you're coming January and February, you're coming there, you're gonna get a little bit of growth, a little bit of growth, and then it dies off again. So that's the reason you use a winterizer in March or April, one of these two times, April 15th, your last fertilization time. And like I said, use a winterizer there. The next time you're gonna fertilize is gonna be way down here in August, at the end of August, 1st of September. So you'll put the winterizer on up here, and then you put a starter, you want to start a fertilizer to kick your grass off good in September, then you'll fertilize, you can use a 20, 10, 10 or something in that nature, or something maybe even a little bit more heavier. Maybe, maybe you don't want it uh, as, as green then. But then you hit it heavily in October, November, and December. And so if you, this past couple of years, if you fertilize right, if people have done it, you're literally cutting your grass all but about two weeks in January, February. Because this the, the temperature has been almost perfect for growing cool season lawns. Now you can see how the shoot growth and the uh, root growth in here sort of mimic itself as it goes through the months for the cool season grasses. You can see it comes out of March, and then right now, if you look, we're starting into April. So we got April and May, which is really going to be the pinnacle of growth. And it's really going to drop off quick. I'm gonna tell you, at the end of May, last few years it's gotten so hot. A lot of people have struggled to keep brown patch out and that's what uh, is created by fertilizing at the wrong time. If you fertilize during the summer you really feed brown patch and that's the reason a lot of people have issues. They're saying their grass turns brown well that's typical of that grass if you hit it with fertilizer try to green it up it will green up some but also brown patch will fill in right behind it which is a fungus. But you look at your cool season months so if you come in here and fertilize at the end of August, September, now the growth season really starts in October, November, December. And in the past couple of years, January has been pretty good too, up until about the middle. So you can see the nutrition needs for that grass as far as doing the fertilization. Now, totally opposite, you're looking at Bermuda and Zoysia grass, their growth by month. Well, you come out April 15th, I told you, that is the first time that you fertilize a warm season grass. Between, some people would even do it right, right as we come into this, but it's really not warm enough. So April 15th, you put a starter fertilizer in. You're gonna fertilize again there, you, again at the end of May, June, then you fertilize uh, one more time in July, then you put sometime at the end of August, September, you'll put a winterizer on. That will allow that grass, low grass seed, to feed at that time during the winter and grow over the period of the winter and still, and then come out on the back side being ready to go again. So you can see between your nutritional growth here, if your real peak is, is July, August here. It's gonna be, that's when you really wanna get hit it because, and that's when a lot of times you're actually having to cut your grass twice a week because if you fertilize this grass, it will grow pretty heavy. Now, some people put out the nitrogen, you put out the quick release, it's gonna the slow release is over a long period of time. Quick release will be periodic. That's the reason most people, some people like going out there and you try to use a time release during over the season so they don't have to fertilize as much. And as long as it's coated and does what you want it to do, you're fine. I like the idea of, of fertilizing, and I use baby fertilizer a lot when, I, when I'm fertilizing the yard. So your target is in sort of in the middle as long as you do on your response so that, that grass seed or the little seedling gets the nutrition that it needs. I go through this pretty quick. Just make sure you ask questions if you need to. Um, most of you have talked about, I'm sure about testing. I guess most of you have heard Bud Hines and his compost talk, right? 
No, yes, okay. Um, but always test it for lime. Typically in this area, there were a lot of rock quarries here, and I've learned over, over a period of time that we more or less have neutral soil here. And a lot of times, everybody would think it would be a little more acidic. Well, if you fertilize a lot, yeah, it'll become acidic, but also because of the old trees. This whole valley was full of, uh, of large chestnut trees back in the turn of the century. And you know, some of them 150, 200 foot tall, they were called the redwoods of the east. The only place you find it now is over in Joyce Kilmer at the National Park. If you ever get a chance to go over there, it's a wonderful place to go. You can see uh, azaleas and rhododendrons in there. And the rhododendrons, some are 15, 20 foot tall. And they'll have sycamores over there. It takes eight people to hold hands around. And they did have some of the largest hemlocks there, but the adelgia has taken a little bit of a toll on that. But you never want to apply more than 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet. At any one time, the reason being because that lime will have a tendency to burn that grass seedling during the growth period, and you'll see it come out yellow. I can tell you, tested that. I've done it. You can't be a master gardener unless you kill uh, at least one plant three times. So what I did is I went out and I have a broadcast spreader. I'd spread it on there, and I noticed I went out there about four or five days later after it rained, and I looked every place that I turned that thing I didn't pay attention and the lime would just spill out over the side of it and I had nice little half circles through the yard. So you learn over a period of time but uh, what it is. And here is what you're looking at. Here, oh let me go up there and see if I go, I go back. I need to look at this. Oh, what I want you to look at is look at grass seed is like your other plants. This is just a chart. It's slightly in the middle. And if you look at most of your, your plants unless you like blueberries, azaleas, uh, some hostas, some native plants, those all like it a little on the acidic side. Uh, hydrangeas, if you want them blue, you want an acidic side. If you want them pink, you go the other way. So, but most of our plants like it between six and seven. That's the perfect area. So when you take your soils test, grass is the same way. It likes it in that neutral zone. You know, you can see where the chart, it's really good as far as uh, the varying pHs of what uh, you need. Now this right here is urea. And any of y'all that remember that when they blew up the Oklahoma City building, if you're old enough, then they had an entire truck load of this. This stuff, if you throw it out, your grass, if you can water it in quick enough, it will green up. If you let this sit on the leaves, it will burn the leaves. But this is one of the things that causes it's very, very high in nitrogen. It doesn't matter if you put it on warm season or cool season, that plant is gonna take this up. Now. This is even better. This is, has a slow burn potential because it's coated. You like the polymer coated uh, if you can get it and it'll release a little bit slower too. So if you can find the polymer coated uh, fertilizers, they're much better over a longer period of time. Now this is dolomitic lime. This also has another good purpose. When it says dolomitic, it means it has calcium in it. And if you'll take a handful of this, I know I'm going off subject, but if you take a handful of this, when you plant your tomato plants and you put it down underneath just a little handful of it, it will actually help blossom in raw. My grandfather used to take, he'd put fish underneath his. He'd just, we can go fish and he'd bring it and he said, go out there and bury it underneath that plant. And so he had fish emulsion, but he did everything the way he was supposed to. He did coffee grounds, eggshells, you know, fish. It didn't matter. I have to go out and clean the chicken coop out. You'd throw all that stuff on there. But this is actually really, really good. So the dolomitic lime is good as far as going out there. Now this is granular sulfur. Some of you may need this, some may not. If you live in Red Bank where the old quarry was out there, I can promise you, you'll probably have to put sulfur. There was a gentleman who did a soils test back in the early 80s, right after they closed the quarry. Well, he went out there and checked. He needed a thousand pounds of sulfur per thousand square feet because it was so, so alkaline. But this right here, this is also good if you want to turn your hydrangeas blue. So it works really, really good. Don't do this. A lot of people don't pay attention. That's the reason you have to watch for your spreader. If, you, if you've got a small yard, try using a drop spreader. If you have uh, a large yard, you know, you can use a, uh, uh, use the uh, rotary uh, as far as on the outside, it'll, it'll spray it much larger. Now we're gonna talk just a little bit about watering when you're establishing your lawn. Here, the real thing I've learned over a period of time, I, I did a, uh, it was a Norton system that I used for watering in my yard. And I, thought, I may have a shot of it, 
But what it does, it's very low to the ground. It's not like an impulse sprayer. Impulse sprayers, when they go out there, they spray way too wide. And you don't want to extend the dew period. So what they found is that if you have a heavy dew, you really don't want to water between seven and nine. You'd be better off after nine, between nine and 11 o'clock. Because if you extend that dew period, especially during summer on warm season grass, you have a tendency to create fungus. And that once it gets warm, you'll see more and more of that. Now this right here is an impulse sprayer. This one, it will cover large areas. A lot of football fields use it. Uh, large lawns use it. You know, and really, if people say, you know, I don't have a big enough yard, how do I? And the one inch is the rule. You want one inch per week. And Stephanie came up with an idea, the best way she found is, we did have a little gauge outside that we looked at, but in order to see what we had over the yard, we put out uh, little tuna fish cans, and they're about one inch deep. So you let your sprinkler go when that can was one inch deep and one inch on your yard. So that works good in your flower beds too. <clears throat> but it says a tenth to three tenths of an inch of each day. You know that basically it works out to about one inch. Now this was a Norton system that I had. It's very low to the ground. People said it looked like dancing fairies in the yard. I had it in the backyard too. Now the neighbors back behind me loved it because I turned it on during the summer. I'd play my nice soothing music. I come in from the evening and the people would go out there and sit in their hot tub and, and look at and drink their margaritas. So they were watching that as, as it, they say it looked like dancing fairies in the yard. But I'm going to explain to you a little bit uh, those little patches in the yard that that this was probably about two months after I put this uh, put the turf down. So if irrigation is not an option, raise the height of, the, of your turf. What it does, but, and that was what I was telling everybody, if you raise that, raise that lawnmower up and you cut, cut it, instead of cutting it an inch and a half, raise it up to three to six inches, what that does, that holds the moisture in, <coughs> excuse me, it holds the moisture in, plus it keep, cuts off the sunlight, keeps the weed seeds from germinating, and then any nutrition that has down in there on the inside of that, it will actually do better. And I'm gonna show you something in the latter half of this that makes this even better if you do this too. Now, if you look at the front yard, that's what I was telling you, a little small area that was between there. Look how green this is. And you can see what time of season. Look at all the black eyed Susans are in blue. So this is probably the first part of summer, midsummer, right there, June. And it's, the grass just does really, really well. Now you'll see an area here. This was right after I did it. I didn't have enough. I did it a piece at a time. So on the other side, I put plugs in over there just to see what it would do. But that's what, this is what it looks like once you go through that and you do the watering and you're doing the right maintenance to it. This is how your, your lawn really wants to look. Okay, now I'll put in some other pictures. On the inside of this, I told you about that path that ran to the back. If you can see over in the back, I have a lot of shade that goes from and this is how you sort of have to plan. It goes from full sun on uh, back behind me, all the way across and west is sort of right behind that, that uh, bird feeder. So if you go through here, the sun follows that path across. So you can see what would happen if, if I uh, didn't cut the grass off right here, but it leads you to the place you want. So it, it acts as a highlight. Over here on the other side of the yard, where we wanted to have yard, I, I used a nice sharp edge around with the grass. So we didn't have on this side right here, it's very, very wet back in this area right here. And we had swamp roses back in here and they would, they're single bloomers, but they would bloom and bloom and bloom. So as you come down through the area outside, more of the plants got sort of on the top of the ground through here. So you have to watch your moisture. That's the reason grass that I put over here, I put about, probably about 20 tons of sand and, and topsoil in there. Now, as you go through here, the path, this one area right here, I started out with a fescue. You can actually start with a different turf grass and see how they do if you're not sure what you want. But what we did, we put plantings in here and you can see the different varieties we have. We got cone flowers and I've got banana trees and we created an arbor with grasses around the side. But what we did is every place in our yard we used as a highlight and we sort of figured out how we wanted to have the grass through the yard before we actually started. So that you need to tell if you're doing the yard or if you've got somebody asking you questions, 
take the landscape design and say, if you don't talk about that next week and look at where you want to have your plants, where you want to have your grass. This was our pond in the back. She always wanted me to put this in here because having a water feature is always really good in the yard because it attracts different wildlife. And the one thing I want you to remember from this first part, long grasses do not do well in the shade, no matter what kind of grass you do. It's four to six hours of sun. And you'll see as I, I go through my talks, they'll have, they'll have beds in and around trees because that's really where it doesn't show up. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this one. Let's see. Let's see here. here it is. I'm going to back out of this one. I'm going to go. Y'all want to grab something to drink while I'm loading this back up? Uh, let's see. I'm Okay. Okay. Screen share. Okay. Good time, Mike. Okay. Now, if we want to take just a little bit of break, I need to get a drink. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, hey, Tom, did they have, they had everything in their book, didn't they? Um, there's a turf grass section. Okay. Well, the only thing that I like for them to have, if they could possibly get it, is the same one that I give out the beginners. I love that lawn maintenance manual that we give them. It's absolutely wonderful. It's one of the best ones that you can get because it gives them all the details that they need. It also helps it when you're giving talks and stuff, you can't quite remember things. There's a few questions too, Mike. We'll, okay, go ahead. We'll, we'll cover the questions. There's only three questions. Okay, go ahead, Tom. Okay, the first one is, do warm season grasses like full sun? All of them do. Uh, warm season, cool season, four, just remember, any grass that you grow is four to six hours. What's gonna happen? on any type of grass. You can put it in the shade early in the year. I get this question all the time. Well, I put grass, I put my grass seed out. Boy, it came up, it looked really, really good in underneath that trees. And guess what? Trees leaf out. And about after they get full in there, that's the reason bulbs do so well under trees. They all the bulbs can come out and they'll bloom before before you ever trees leaf out. So it looks, they'll look really good. They'll die back off. You don't have a problem with it. Grass does not do that. When you put that grass underneath there, that little seedling wants to continue to try to grow the whole time. It won't do very well at all. But warm season grass, the hotter it is, the better it is. Uh, on the cool season lawn, really, it likes it cool, uh, cool to cold, and they do much better during the fall and the early spring. I'm the one that asked that question, and uh, I was just wondering, would the warm or the cool season grasses do better in a shady area and it looks like neither will do well. No, that's a problem. It will do okay until it leaves out. What it is, it's the sunlight that gets them. Because it, I'll show you a section. I hope I got that picture in the second half. I got a part of my yard. I had two little patches. They were three by three. They only had the cool season lawn. The reason being I did the same thing you did. I couldn't get the warm season grass to really grow there. So I knew a red creeping fescue would grow a little better. So I threw some in. It actually did okay. Red creeping does all right because it feeds from the runners. And so if you get a four, you know, marginal on getting that four hours of sun, you might you know, be able to trick it a little bit around the edge. Is that what they put in like the shade mix seed? You know? Well, they, they'll put- I heard that it didn't work, but- Yeah, they put the shade in there. That's, that's a misnomer because the shade mix, they're just, like I said, it's four to six hours. And if you don't get that, you're gonna be, once you get, Below that four hour, you're, you're three, three and a half, you're going to have some growth, but you're going to see spotches, you know, little sp uh, splotches in your yard you know, where that, that shade is, and it's going to fill in with weeds. Okay, thanks. Okay. I think, that, I think this next one sums up all the other three. It says, is it possible to eliminate common Bermuda for dreaming? Okay. Uh, I, I, was, I was afraid somebody's going to ask this question. <laughs> this is, that's one of the best questions because most master gardeners ask the same, they're going through this class, ask the same thing. Here's my scenario on comma Bermuda, okay? If you're talking about a flower bed, here's what you do. You will never truly, Tom and I use Fusillade 2, and it's called, it says it retards Bermuda grass. Now, the thing that I found is supposed, people say it's supposed to kill it. No, I'm going to tell you, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why. What they do is typically you spread around the outside. 
and, and I'm going to go over the flower bed. This is the one thing that I found that it will work. If you've got flower beds, what I tell you to do is if you can dig up all your perennials out of that flower bed, you want to do this in late August, okay? Dig up everything out of there. If you've got shrubs, I want you to take and that you want to protect and don't want to dig them up, wrap them up with a plastic around the outside or a sheet or something to keep this because you're getting ready to really hammer this Bermuda grass. Let the Bermuda grass grow up till almost to seed. Everybody saw how ugly it looks. Do not let it go to seed. What you're gonna do is you're taking out all your plants. You've let this grow up. Now you're gonna take and use Fuselade 2 or a something that you can spray or Roundup, God forbid. I don't use that as much anymore because I've read all the other stuff. But you spray all of it in there. So what it is, it's a systemic killer. All that stuff is gonna go through the grass, into the root, down below. That's what you're after. Now, once you spray this, give it time, about a day or so, then I want you to get black plastic. Lay the black plastic over it, put it over the top of this whole bed of what you're trying to kill out. Then on top of that, you're gonna take and put logs, you know, wood, whatever you can do. And then you're going to put another layer on top of that. Now you've created a real hot tent. Guess what month it is? We're in August. What you're literally going to do is sterilize that soil. This is the one thing that I've found that you can do to Bermuda grass. Now, if it's in your lawn, the Fusilade 2 that's out there, and I'm going to give you a story of, uh, of how this stuff is, I'm not so sure. One year I had uh, on the side of the house, I had my. Uh, zoysia grass, and I got an intrusion of, of uh, Bermuda. Common Bermuda came from the next door neighbor, came across, ran into my yard, and I said, well, I've got a little short area, I'm gonna try to try to get rid of it. Well, I wanna say it was sometime like in August, maybe early September, I took and we spray, I sprayed the entire area in there real lightly, because I, I was afraid I'd get burned. So I, was, I did it when it was, the temperature was down in the 80s. So I sprayed it. I went to my condo, came back, came back a week later. That whole area of zoysia grass was, had died. It killed every bit because it burned it up. Getting in there with my thatch rate, get to the bottom, guess what's still alive at the bottom of it? The Bermuda grass. So if it gets in there, it's gonna cause you issues. What you're gonna have to do, if you wanna really get rid of it, you can spray it. Just understand two things. You're probably gonna end up having to renovate that lawn on the inside. Or if you use a cool season lawn, you have cool season lawn, then you can take, go put grass seed or put new plants in there. Those are the ways that I've found that you can do it. But Bermuda grass is a scourge. Tom will tell you, we've been fighting it like the devil down to the hummingbird butterfly garden. And the good thing about it is we spray the outside edge. This year, I've got to go in there and I've got to dig the mums up and I'm going to pull them apart down there. And me and the Bermuda grass are going to go at it hand in toe. So, if that answers your question, that's the best I can do with it. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Is everyone ready for the next half? Okay, everybody ready to go? Okay. What we're going to talk about in this half is lawn renovation. This is the next big subject that you will get on lawns. Now, when I talk about lawns here, like I told you, I'm a real big believer in just gardens now. I, let them, I, I like using lawns as highlights. I think you get so much more out of it. I think if you do both together, I think it looks absolutely great. So, now let me get over here and get to this. I gotta get to the slideshow. There we go. All right. Okay. Now, I love this first statement. Ideally, you would like a lawn without using a lot of your free time. Adopting lawn care approach minimizes weeds in addition to providing desired appearance. By optimizing lawn weed growth, space available for Weeds is minimized. Now, I do like that one. The closed canopy also provides a desired appearance and minimizes the weeds. So if you're, you're doing it the right way, you're gonna, you're gonna, you can have a good lawn and you don't have to do as much work to it. You don't have to do as much weeding once you establish a good lawn. Now, why renovate a lawn? Diseases, pests, and typically it's weeds. Typically it's the last one that people end up renovating a lawn. Now, is this lawn worth saving? I don't think so. And I've used this slide for year after year because I think it's the best, <laughs> best one that you can do. So if you do have 50% or more good lawn grass and you only have 
patching your yard, I'm going to show you something that you want to suggest to people that can make it where you can do the lawn without totally renovating. There we go. Oh, there it is. Now, white grubs, you're going to see this. You'll see them if you see June bugs or Japanese beetles flying around your yard. Typically, this is where they come from. Now, in a yard I'd use, if you get cut up an area, you look and see these little half dollar pieces out in your yard, the little brown spots, and you dig up a square and there's more than seven of these per square foot, then you've got a beetle problem. And with grubs, the good thing about it is you can use milky spore, which is a BT, which it basically it kills only that grub. You can spread it out and it will actually stay in your yard for 10 years. It gets rid of Japanese beetles. This is typically what most people see when they fertilize way too late. You will get some of this even, even on your fescue lawns during August. And because it, what it does, it does not like nitrogen or it will eat it up. Uh, let me take it back. It will eat the nitrogen up. It does, and your grass does not like to be fertilized at this time. So people that fertilize real late say, oh man, my grass, you know, it looked real green after fertilizing, it looks real bad. Well, you're fertilizing during the summer when that grass is trying to be dormant. Now you'll see slime mold from time to time. People say, oh, I've got this growth out on my grass. Well, what it is, they probably cut the grass at a time when it was right before rain. And so all they had all that cuttings laying on top of or thatch and that mold will feed on that. So you'll see this more or not if, if they cut it uh, really late. Now, Always remember saying, I love it. There's other ways to put it. A weed is a plant growing where it's not wanted. So if you grow a flower out in your grass, it's a weed. If you grow muta grass or others in your flower bed, it's a weed. So it's, it's just lost its way and don't know where it's going. So you have to direct it a little bit. Summer annual weed. This is, a annual, this is Japanese stilt grass. This will show up in the sun or shade. Typically I got this in shade. It is, it is related to a warm season grass. So if you spray Fusilade 2 on this, it will actually kill it. Also, Roundup will kill it. Broadleaf weed, now you gotta understand, there are three types of weeds. As a master gardener, you got, you got, uh, uh, you got grassy weeds, you got broadleaf weeds, and you got sedges and calendulas. Most of you know uh, purple and yellow nutgrass. That is a sedge or, or, or a nutgrass. And then the uh, calendulas are in that same variety. So there's only three types of weeds. Now the bottom, there's two types of, of, uh, of uh, crabgrass. You got large, and you, this is a smooth crabgrass, and you have the larger one. And this is the smart weed. And by the way, that's the other reason I grew, grew the warm season grasses. These have a tendency to grow the same time as your warm season grass. They grow during the summer. And some of them have overwintered. This one right here is very smart. This is goosegrass. Goosegrass, the more you cut it, the flatter it will lay. You see those little bitty seeds right there along top of that? Each one of these, probably 40, 50,000 once it gets to that season. Then here, here's, the, you got the two, you got the goosegrass on one side over on the left, you got the crabgrass. So you can sort of see the difference between the two. They're similar, but you're gonna have, they're gonna be a little bit different. This is the number one grass, weedy grass of Tennessee, the Stalus grass. And you'll see it when it grows through, it, and kids just love it. And I used to love it as a kid because you could take it, and you, you could take and pop all those things and make them run all over the place. But it will, you can see how it grows. It is, it is a weedy grass. Now, for those of you that have reasonable grass or somebody, friend of yours that has a reasonable grass, this is what you would really like to have used in your yard. This is called a seed slitter. This thing is absolutely wonderful because if you have 50, 75% lawn grass out there and you only got certain sections you need to fix, this is absolutely good. By the way, Stephanie just walked in from work. Everybody say hi. Hi. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you can do is the top of these things, the tops open up. See down at the bottom, they got these little tines that are right here at the bottom. And what you do is set them right, touch your grass through your grass uh, to go through the grassy area that you have. So what it does, you fill that up, you can set the slitter to whatever you want. And as it goes through your yard, it's going to cut little slits right through your yard. And it's going to drop the seed in that little furrow. So as it goes down through there, you're going to get 80 to 90% germination versus 
getting 40 to 50 percent if you use just a, a rotary spreader because if it lays on top that little grass seedling won't grow you want it to get in touch with the with the ground once it touches the ground it's going to grow so these are absolutely wonderful you can get them uh out on lee highway uh, action rent I, I knew i'd think of it so in five weeks look what it's done it's made touch with all that and all those grass seedling little seedlings have come up through there now Granted, you may have weeds in your yard, but you could spot, you know, if you wanted to spot them before you did this, you could spot spray them like with a broadleaf weed killer or you could broadleaf so you spray after that. But say you had a patch of, of grassy weeds out there like uh, goose grass or Dallas grass, any of that. You could go ahead and spray that, let that die out and then come back and use this slitter right behind it. Now, 90% of the homeowners have 90% weeds. That is absolutely the truth. Because if you do this, if you take a look, now this yard, I would probably take and look at it. Now, they, now if you look here, they got clover. Clover's not such a bad weed because it's a legume. It's going to put nitrogen back in. But if you look at all this other through here, I might want to take and reconsider how I have, if that grass may not grow there. Also, these, I, I hate this picture, but it's got two Bradford pears in it, and I'm not a big Bradford pear person. But if you look at the yard, all this in here can all be, redone now when it gets to this point yes it needs renovation when it gets that many weeds in it you got to do something or i'm looking at the bottom down here this is probably where you either had crabgrass goosegrass something that died off during the winter so you're going to renovate a turf so if you if it's more like i said 50 percent if it's less than that you've got to get something that's going to get rid of those areas roundup i don't like glyphosate so much but you can also get finale, which is pretty good. Some people have, have uh, weed stop. There's different ones that are out there now that can do similar things that we're talking about. If you've got a large patch of, of Bermuda grass, you can go out there and, uh, and, and look at, uh, at spot spraying. One of the things that I did tell everybody, as homeowners, you want to recommend to them that they use fall direction. That's the reason I tell them to use these spray dials. They're really, really good. The stop spray is already measured. If you ever look at Roundup, the one reason why I think we have a big problem is because a lot of people, it only has 1% of active ingredient. If you follow the directions as a homeowner, we don't have those problems. But uh, typically, the homeowners will go out there and get those big gallon sprayers and spray it. And so if you look at these different lawns, yeah, you want to look at this. This is all crabgrass that's right here. This one here has got spot. That's probably got Bermuda, crabgrass, and everything up in there. So you want to look at the renovation part of it and take care of it. Now, this was my front yard. And you see that little strip I missed right there? This, people, and it was a real funny story. I, before I put my azoza grass out in the front, I, I went and planted annual ryegrass. I planted it the winter before. It was nice, green, beautiful, looked great. And people came out there, and I guess this was probably about April, and they said, Oh my God, you killed your nice green grass. No, I knew what I was going to do. That green grass, I killed it out and all the nitrogen went back into the soil. And this is called, this. they call this a thatch rake or a dethatcher. I took this and run in behind this. This pulled up everything that was in there. And if you have warm season grass, typically you would want to dethatch about every two to three years. Thatch is that layer that builds up between the tiller and the ground. And if it gets a half inch or more thick, it won't allow the water and nutrients to get down there as easily. And in this little front yard that's right here, it's 1,800 square feet, I got five wheelbarrows of thatch after two years. You can see how much they've got out of this yard. So I took that up. Now this is the next step. Now, like I said, most people use Kentucky 31. He's got a wheelbarrow. He's killed out all his grass here. He's take. He's got a spreader here. He's got two different types. He's got the little bag spreader so he can get next to the sidewalk with his fertilizer. And then he's they're going to he's going to put cool season lawn grass out. And this would be best done in August and September. Now, the tank type sprayer is what most homeowners use. And you look right here, and I tell them if they're going to use Roundup, use the measuring cup, which is right here. And people say, well, what's the ammonia for? The ammonia for is to clean that tank out after he's done because if they don't if they don't put a label on this and use that particularly for weed killer can you imagine if your wife you went out and sprayed your wife's or your husband's 500 dollars japanese maple with weed killer 
I don't think they'd be too happy. By the way, this is the green lawn right before I sprayed it that spring. See what they were talking about? I let it grow up about two cuttings, and then I went out and sprayed it. And that's what the brown color is what you got. So that's what he's doing. He's letting it grow up. And by the way, this yard that he's treating was all crabgrass at one time. So I came back, I mowed mine down. Some people don't do it. I took mowed all the dead grass down and then I, kind of, I did my, my prep in the front yard. Now the difference between what he's doing and what I'm doing, I'm prepping for warm season grass. He's prepping for a cool season one. Now you can tell which one has been sprayed. And if I was his neighbor, I might be a little bit upset right here. And neighbors over here, I don't know about, but he's on the other side and it's right close to the fence. But if you've got expensive shrubs, trees, if you're gonna do it and people are gonna do it, recommend that they cover up stuff because if that spray gets out and blows over on it and try not to spray on a windy day, you're gonna have some issues. Now, this is after he sprayed. I'm sure he covered up everything because it looks, still looks really good out there on the outside. He's got, he's got maybe mums or zinnias or something like that, but he's sprayed, he's ready to remove his grass. Now, I've treated everything with the herbicide and mowed it down, get mine ready. Now, he's got the thatcher, the thatcher going out there. He's, he's pulling up all those dead seedlings. Now, if I'm him, this is the one time I do not put dead grass in my compost pile because he had, he had all that crab grasses out there. It had seeds. And if you throw that in the compost pile, guess what? You're going to get it out of your compost too. So I'm breaking up all the thatch. I already run the dethatch machine over through this. This is what it looks like after you get done. This is, this, I'm just showing you the piles of thatch that you're going to get out of your lawn. And you rake it up, put it in a wheelbarrow. Now mine, I could put in the compost pile because it doesn't have very many seeds at all. And I, mine was just treated. And what I did after I treated all that, I went here and I put about three tons. It's a combination of mushroom compost, river sand, and topsoil. If you can get a third, a third, and a third, they absolutely works good as far as that. And that little flag I got in there is where I marked for my irrigation. So I, I tilled all this up and then I mixed everything back in. So I'm prepping mine for this. And typically if you order a sod, sod will come in about 500 square feet per pallet. And what I'm telling you is I prepped that soil that's in there. I prepped everything about two weeks prior to ordering this sod. I knew when the sod was gonna be ready. They told me it's gonna be about the end of May, first of June before they cut the sod. So I prepped it. I knew I needed about 1500 square feet. So I needed about three pallets. So I placed the order. I had everything already prepped. The soil was already down. I tilled it up, raked it down, and I watered it the night before I was ready to put this down. So then in putting the sod down, I've got it down and I put it down just like you, anybody ever put tile down or done any of that, you take and bust the seams. Now, where do you think the weed showed up in between the seams? Because I put the sod down out here on the outside of this. Now, I, I, I wet the ground and I always have, like I said, you always have a good watering person. As you can see, I have a pretty good one right here. So she kept watering out ahead of me while I was putting the sod in there. Now, for those of you that are gonna put seed down, like I told you, you this is when you wanna use your blend. You wanna put the blend out there. It's, it's got the different varieties in it. You're ready to go in with your grass seed. So he's putting his grass seed down, putting it out there over the top. Now, a lot of people will go in there and they'll take, put straw down. The straw is just there to help hold the little seedling in place. And typically, even if you buy the fescue, a big bag of fescue, at least put five or 10% of annual rye in there. If you can do that, put, a, uh, put five or 10%, what that's gonna do, that's gonna germinate within seven days. So that's gonna go up because it's gonna take longer for the small little fescue seeds to germinate. So you wanna make sure that you take and do that. You can take and put the seed, uh, straw down, but put it very, very lightly. Now he's coming back and putting a starter fertilizer over the yard. That's really, really crucial because you want to get to see, the seedling has enough to get started, but you'd like to get him through the first season. So now you water. And it's like the, when you first do the lawn, you want to take and do 
uh, the watering to go along with it. So as you do the watering to come back behind it, you want to water and keep the ground moist, not soaking wet, just moist enough so that that seedling gets enough water to germinate. So then once it gets about an inch and a half to two inches high, then you'll want to take, and that's when you want to start watering a week, uh, a week, uh, inch per week. So, and, you know, I like the deeper, the better. That's the reason I like tilling mine up and, and he did not do that on his, he just killed it. Now they may have aerated the lawn, which is really good. You can do that before you put the seed down also, but it makes it easier for that seed to germinate. Now, this right here, like I told you, I'm watering this, and I told you about those little patches I'd tell you about. Well, I told you to have everything ready. If you're gonna use sod, have everything ready to go. I had everything perfectly ready. My sod came in on Thursday. I started putting it down on Saturday. I was finished by Sunday morning. During the time that they brought it up there, they cut it on a Wednesday and brought it. That sod had already started compost at the bottom because the temperatures were in the 60s and 70s at that time. So as you can see, I got bare patches in here. I wasn't worried about it. I threw sand in it over a period of time. The rhizomes and stolen fill in. Now, if you do it with, with sod on fescue or fescue or cool season, just have you a little bit of seed that you can throw back in there and it'll fill in these holes over a period of time. And this is what his lawn looked like about uh, two to four weeks after he had done it. I think this is actually six weeks. But it's more uniform, it's more, and you don't have all those seeds out there, and I think it looks really, really nice. Now you do have to go back behind and you're gonna get you're gonna get weeds, see uh, weeds in there, you're gonna get clover, you might get vermintograss. If you catch it early and you can hand pick this stuff, if you go out there and just walk it, walk it in the evenings, I call it zen weeding. You walk it in the evenings, you can pull it out. So it really works really well. Now this is, like I said, this is what mine looked like after it's basically done. And that's about four to six weeks afterwards. I'm filling in the spots in there. And you can see where it is. Grape myrtles are just now starting to bloom. Now these are different lawns that are out there. And like I said, the one down in the bottom here is you can see on the left-hand side, it actually has some shade in there. And the good part about the shade, it works out really good in there. If you limb the tree up or you have an area where the sun comes across and you can get that four to six hours of sun, it works really good. Yeah, otherwise, you don't have, probably have to put some kind of bed in there where it would take less sun. So all these really look good. And he's inspecting for the weeds behind it. That's what you have to do. You go out there in the evening, take your, take your cocktail with you, whatever you may want walk out there, or if you get the chance early morning, it's actually good with coffee too. Just walk around, you can hand pull it. If it doesn't get started, then you, you don't have near the problem as you do later on. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the maintenance part. I know some of you know about pre-emergence. And what this is, about the end of January, 1st of February, you can actually do it now, but once the forsythia blooms, crabgrass, goosegrass, all those other weedy grasses have started to germinate. You can always tell when the forsythia comes out, that's the time when they're all germinating. But if you put a non-selective or, or not, uh, put a, put a pre-emergent herbicide on that, you got surfland and there's one that pendamenthin, I'll show it later, uh, that you can see what happens. This is one with the chemical, this is one without. So you can see that it germinates. So here's some examples. You got dementia, and here's one, the ones here, you got high yield, you can get that, I've seen that around, it's got, this is the chemical in it. Pendamenthin, you got Scott's Halt or high yield, both those have it. And I think I got the same side. But this is a little bit, just a little bit. You look at Barricade, those are some of the chemicals that you can actually get uh, from, from the different uh, places like the barn. If you go to, to the good ones, you can, you can go to Beatty's in Cleveland, he'll give you a different one, dementia. That's really good. But the pre-emergent herbicides, this is the reason you look at it. See where February and March is? You're getting Dallas grass, but like I said, you're at the tail end of it, the first of April right now. Then you can take, you can actually put another application in June to help get rid of Dallas grass, and then crabgrass is always there too. So you got goosegrass. Those are the ones that I really hate because they, once they get in, they establish the roots. Now, post-emergent herbicides are totally different. So you wanna look for things that have 
Those three chemicals, if you can find one that has those three in it, it will treat 90% of the weeds. And the post-emergent is gonna be a systemic spray. So dicambia, MC, PP, and 2,4-D. The two at the bottom are the ones you see the most common now. Dicambia is getting a little bit harder to find. There's one that Clay Beatty has I like to use, it's called four-way. And it, it treats all the ones too. There are several out there, but if you're talking to the homeowner, Typically, these are the ones that are going to see weed be gone and spectracide. And so you, you make the recommendation to them and tell them to follow the direction. That's the biggest issue with most of them. Now, the post-emergent herbicides during summer annual broadleaves, you're looking at it right here. From about the middle of May all the way to, <laughs> it may even go into the last part of August because it's so hot. So you're looking at, these are the ones that you're going to see. You're going to see the uh, the Broadleaf weeds, prostate spurge is a big one. It runs across, then you get common first lane that runs out there. And then you got, there's a whole bunch of other broadleaves that are out there. You got wild violets are the hardest ones to get rid of, and they're a pain in the butt. And that may have to go into a dissertation about that, how to get rid of that too. But if you go and look at winter annual weeds, which uh, if you've got cool season lawns, you really don't want to have. So you're going to have to use the post-emergent herbicides at this time to get rid of the annual weeds that are during the winter. So they're going to have hen bits, one of them. And so then this is, you got purple dead nettle. And you got ground ivy, which is this one here. So these, you'll see they grow at the same time as your, as your uh, cool season grasses, but you want to, that's why you want to treat it. Now during the summer, you can use a, uh, uh, the, uh, the weedy grasses, you can spray them during the summer and then you could just put a little cover out if you were to kill your grass a little bit, you could actually cover it. So uh, weeds is a whole different animal, but just remember there's only three types. So if you're treating one, each one, you're going to treat a broad spectrum, especially on broad leaves, and then your weedy, uh, your weedy grasses such as uh, Dallas grass, goose grass, and all that, you want to make sure you catch it early as you can. You can spot spray it, but the problem is when the same chemicals you use to spot spray that after it comes up is actually going to damage or kill your grass too. So there's a fine line right there that you have to walk to make sure it works. Now on cutting, the real the one on the left is typically for warm season grasses. I did use a rotary mower that's over here on the side. Have please have one with adjustable wheels where you can adjust it up and down. I did bag all my grasses. I did put my grass in the compost pile. I just like doing it. I love, I like compost anyway. Now, mowing requirements on tall fescues. You can see as, as the season grows, you're also gonna have, you, you cut it at different times. Like I told you, look at January and February. If you get down here, you're, you should be not mowing very much, but you still gotta mow some because if you have a warm month, it's gonna grow. Now. March, April, May, June, July, all the way through the summer on a cool season line, it's going to grow some because I told you that rain or that irrigation system or whatever you may have, it's going to act as an air conditioner. It's going to cause that grass to grow because it doesn't know any different. Now, it's, it, you're going to hit another pinnacle when you get October, November, because remember, you fertilized again. So that fertilizer gets out there. That grass is going to continue to grow on through. Now, Bermuda and Zoysia, you can see, with it being brown, it doesn't green up. It starts greening up here in April, and then it hits its pinnacle June, July, August, and even into September, it doesn't really start dying off until after we get the last frost. And this last year, I don't think we got it until November. So you're gonna, it, it's, it'll stay green up until that time. Now, here are some of the different mowers. If you got a large lawn, this is great. Here's one with a bag mower in the back. Now these have uh, a mulching on the bottom. These are mulching blades on the bottom. These are absolutely great. If you don't like bagging, these work perfect because what they do, it cuts all that blade up real fine. It will decompose and it adds nitrogen right back into your soil. So each one of these works really, really good. And so if people want to mulch, they can have a mulching mower. If not, you can bag it and you put it, put it in your compost box. Now, for the optimum appearance, Minimum weeding, each lawn grass has an ideal mowing height. We're going to show the different heights. Mow, uh, mow to the height, and you're going to 
close that canopy. That's, I can't tell you how much that's really important because the closer those blades are and the less light that it allows to the bottom, the longer it's gonna hold that moisture, gonna keep that light from letting weeds germinate. The mowing frequency is how long you let go in between. Most people, they like to mow once a week. If you fertilize really well, you may have to do it twice a week because it's really gonna hit, they'll hit that net. That during its peak season, that's what that little seedling, little, the, all, they are, all of them are trying to do. They're all trying to grow at the same time. So the one third rule comes into effect. I don't know if Tom's talked to y'all about that, but on pruning, John Ness will talk about that too. Never take off more than one third of the top because if you scalp that lawn, you get down to it, it can damage that little seedling just like anything else. Same thing with trees or shrubs. You never wanna take off more than one third of that growth. So if you you're, if you got a large shrub, you prune it back to a little bit at a time over several, two, three years. It works really, really good. Also, you can look at it and it gives you a little bit better understanding of how, they, and I hate crepe murder. I just, that just drives me crazy. Okay, so the mowing heights, if you look here, fescues, are all down through here. It gives you two, three, three inch, five. And I like on blends, because you have so many different ratings, anywhere from three to five and a half inches. And I tell people during the summer, set your on, on cool season grasses, set your blade or your mower as high as you can get it. Set it up there. Don't worry about it because on the top, if you clip that off on that, it's just gonna your grass is gonna be healthier for it. And it's gonna be really, really good. Now you can see down here. Stephanie kept trying to get me to cut my zoysia grass to three quarters of an inch because she wanted to put a putting green out in the yard. And I said, no, I'd have to do too much paint. I mean, I have to cut it every two or three days. But if you look at the cut heights, I kept mine about an inch and a half. That's fine. You send a piece an inch and a half, two and a half for these because they have such a tight knit close canopy anyway. They are a true turf grass. Now, if you can look, mow often, change direction to eliminate the soil compaction in the grain. Because over a period of time, even though you're doing it, if you walk the same direction, same thing every time, you're going to compact that soil faster. You're still going to do it. And try not to do it right after a rain. Sometimes you can't help it. But also remember that if you do this, also look, every two to three years, look at aerating your lawn because you'll pull the plugs out of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you pull plugs out of it, and it's going to open up that soil and make it much nicer for that grass to grow. Now, this is a problem that most homeowners have. And a lot of them don't pay attention. Say, oh, well, that's a nice stripe in my yard. Well, it may be, but it's one of two things. Either they use the drop spreader to put fertilizer on or lime, and then they didn't go two different directions. Rotary spreader is not as bad because it broadcasts. If you have a drop spreader though, you need to go 90 degrees to it because you want to drop the, the fertilizer or the lime and maybe sulfur um, you want to drop it evenly over everything so you don't end up with stripes in your yard. Now, this is my pet peeve for this area, soil compaction. And so if it's not compact, you generally have 50% soil, a quarter, quarter percent of air, and a quarter percent of water. Now, the compacted soil we have in this area, we have heavy clay, chert, and like I said, chert is, uh, to me, a four-letter word with an extra letter added. So, because you will be seeing it if you start digging in it. So, you take this, how do I get from there to here? Well, you can till it, you can add uh, organic material, but if you're in a lawn, you don't want to tear your nice lawn up, this is the way you can do it. This is called a core aerator. And I generally ask for hands of people that have done this, because if you haven't done this, it's right, right grabbing hold of a rear tine tiller, full blast. If you got a front time, it's either faster. You take this little handle right here, you yank on this handle, it drops these tines down in there. By the way, if you've got a pull behind, all you do is load this up cinder block and hook it. But you drop these tines in there. And the first time you do this, only open it about a quarter of the way because when you grab this handle, it will yank your butt all the way across the yard as fast as you can go. You'll never, you, you won't have to worry about running and exercising because this will do it to you. So. When you do this, oh, by the way, this is even better. You put heavy cinder blocks on top of this. This is a commercial grade. And, and they have one that's even better than this. It's a hydraulic. I'll show it to you in a minute. I think I've got a picture of it. But what it does, 
it pulls these cores out down here in the bottom and they eject it. Once you go two or three passes across your yard, I did 1500 square feet in less than a half hour. That's how fast this thing will move. You can actually rent it and have several neighbors that want to aerate the yard and it didn't cost you hardly anything at all. I think it was at the last time I did it, it was like a hundred bucks. And so if you, if you pay a hundred dollars and you can do, if you rent it on a Saturday afternoon, you don't have to turn it back into Monday. So if you do it right, you can do probably uh, your, you know, half your entire neighborhood if you're going to do it. But what it does, it's going to look like a bunch of geese went out on your yard after you did it. And this is, this is a commercial one. This is the one they use when they're doing golf courses. Those things are a full eight to 10 inches long. And it pulls out an eight to 10 inch plug out of there. So what happens is on those others, it pulls this little small plug out of here. And what happens is over a period of time, that's the easiest route for those roots, see, roots to grow. So when the roots grow down through there, water goes in there easier, the nutrients go in there easier. It makes that grass seedling much healthier because guess what? It's much cooler during the summer down here, especially on for your cool season lawns than it is up on top. So aeration and over a period of time, look at, look at how many plugs to cut it. Over a period, you can actually change your soil composition over about a three year period. If you aerate twice a year and then even go back one step farther, take, if you've got compost, scatter the compost over the top of these areas, all that's gonna go right back and compost right down inside those holes. All this will fill back in. It will lighten the soil up as you go across. So if you look at how this works, you can see the line that they did here, and that's how this does. By the way, do not do what I did the first time. I didn't realize there were two 65 pound weights in front of this. I tried to pick the whole machine up off the back of the truck at one time and set it down. Yeah, I was a little bit younger. I did learn that you take these out, it makes it much easier because there's a little, two little latches right in the front up here. But what happens is it pulls these plugs out and you got to, it'll actually open up the thatch layer in there too. See that little thatch layer? And that's where the grass clippings will get right at the top of the ground. And if you open this up, you won't have to dethatch as much. It'll open up, all the water goes in, the oxygen goes into it. So it, it starts almost immediately. So you get new deeper eight to 10 weeks, you got a deeper root system. And over a period of three years, you can increase the depth of your soil anywhere from four to eight inches. It's amazing. This is the easiest way to do it and help your yard, especially with all the clays we have. Now, this is the other way. <laughs> if, you, if you're lucky enough, you can do it. I've actually done it one time. I did it in Notre Dame's football field. They took and went on the outside of this, and that mixture I told you with mushroom compost, topsoil, and uh, compost. Uh, I mixed it all in, took a, uh, a little loader, put it inside this, pulled it behind a tractor, and it spreads this out a layer over the top. Then you put about a quarter inch layer down and you water it and it goes right into those holes. This is the mixture that I used. So I used that to put out over the top of that and dress it after I got done. So what it does, if you look at that, when you pull that plug and you fill that top dressing back in, it fills that little slot right back in on the inside of that. So I go through all this pretty fast. I go through the stuff because, like I said, I show some other shots because I like showing the highlights because not only do I teach about lawn grass, but I teach about landscaping and about what you do. Stephanie's going to get a little bit more into detail next week, how to look at your yard a little bit different or look at somebody else's yard if you're trying to help. So like I said, I use this as a path. By the way, the lambs are over here underneath that tree. We never could find anything that would grow underneath the cedar tree because it takes one inch of rain to get any water here. So what we did, we planted the lambs here over here. It never bloomed, but it would come out, make a nice green ground cover. The only fallacy is because it was in the shade, about June, July, it would get a fungus. Well, I'd take the lawnmower, run through there, and then throw a little nitrogen fertilizer. Two or three weeks later, I got a nice ground cover again. This right here is the grass. This is grass will not grow in the shade. But guess what? This is the same week. If you want to slip out of the house, and get into the woods, go down to Pigeon Pocket this week. This is National or, or a Wildflower Week coming up this week in the Tennessee Valley. You can slip off down in these areas. These are all Virginia bluebells, celandine poppies. It gives you an idea of what uh, Mother Nature does without us. So you look at the bluebells. Uh, the Virginia bluebells are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, they're great in the shade. You'll also walk up beside this stream that's there. It's a nice place to go. 
you can take your little backpack, slip up through there, you're out in the woods, you're socializing yourself with your, maybe your family or nobody else. And by the way, there's that area of lambs here. See how nice that looks up underneath. I tried hosta, I, we tried uh, a, Engl actually we put English ivy, it died there. And so it, we put that in there, it turned out really, really nice. That shows you, this is a shade area back. I told you that little stand of grass I had, that was, this was all I had was the, the red fescue that was right here outside because that was, on, it gets shady. As you can see, you go back in the shade, it graduates from lighter sun power uh, uh, hostas here to the deep blues in the back. And by the way, that is a uh, hybrid chestnut tree that we started in, so that somebody gave us two in pots too. So it's like I said, this was the backyard. We had the hydrangeas on this side. That's a redbud tree. Stephanie came up and she put these baskets in the back and she put new ones there. And it was, uh, give us a little spot of color. This to give you some ideas of what's coming for next week. She'll give you a little bit more idea on that. And the main thing I want you to take from this one on this half is use what you have to your advantage. Don't fight the shade, don't fight the sun. Look at what you have and work around it. The only way you can change it, and as I've gotten older, I've liked trees more and more. I found out that it's nicer to work in shade at 90 degrees than it is working in the sun. So I know I'll go through all this stuff. I'd probably go a little bit slower as I, if I was in front of y'all. Uh, and it's a shame I can't because uh, like Tom said, you miss a good food. <laughs> okay, Tom. Thanks a lot, Mike. <clears throat> um, we got this recorded. And thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I put the chat down. Let's see. Yeah, if y'all got some questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, you can, you can unmic yourself too if you want to. And um, 